So welcome, Natalie. It's so great to have you here. Thank you for having me, Nika. This is awesome. I appreciate you and your tribe. Oh, well, this has been a long time coming, I know. And for those who are kind of wondering what tribe, what is she talking about exactly? So I was um, very honored to be appointed the uh, Walker's Legacy Greenville City Director. And we serve all of the upstate. And this is a chapter um, that's part of this larger national effort through Walker's Legacy, which we're going to share all about today. Um, and so many of the members that are part of the Walker's Legacy Greenville Tribe are on with us. And so we've been trying for a couple months now to actually yeah. get Natalie here. And so this is kind of the first time that she's able to connect with some of our tribe members. But, but nonetheless, we're going to get you here at some point once all this is over and behind us, because we will get through it, right? We're going to get through this COVID situation. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I always like to start by, you know, we've given you your proper introduction and I feel like getting all the accolades out of the way and the credentials is, is important and necessary because you've worked incredibly hard. But I always like to hear the more personal story of who are you, your why, right? And so why don't we just start by you sharing with us your story, your why. Put the accolades aside, but tell us your story. Yeah, um, so let's see. So I grew up in Rochester. And I grew up in a household where my mother was working at a Black Enterprise 100 company, which was a big manufacturing company here in Rochester, Kodak, Xerox, Bosch & Lomb, uh, Capital, so to say. And I would watch her as she would get up and go to work. She was a vice president there. She developed lots of different lines of businesses within this entity. And I was always reading business plans for her. She always asked that we read her business plans because she came up with new ideas all the time. And at that time, I hated doing it. Um, it was something that like annoyed me that I had to read something. But I realized, um, you know, when I was 11, 12, 13, uh, reading these business plans that my mom was actually inadvertently teaching uh, me about the principles of entrepreneurship and about the principles of business formation and business creation. And so it goes without saying that, you know, my sisters and I worked on the assembly line in this manufacturing company. I worked in the mailing room. So I was stuffing mail and distributing mail. Um, I worked at the front desk. Um, and when I was in high school, I had three jobs. But one word uh, that really stuck out to me that I knew, um, I learned before I was 16 was procurement. Mm. And <laughs> I remember working um, as an intern at this company and developing, you know, I was the one who answered the phones, but I was also helping them make a little bit of a marketing brochure. And uh, one of the words that we had to put in it was procurement, procurement, procurement. And I just kept saying, what is procurement? Like, I don't understand. What is this word? You know, I'm like 15 yeah. years old. And it's basically, as we all know now, it's the purchasing of something, mm -hmm. right? And it has become, uh, honestly, kind of the, the, the backbone of so much of the work that I do, procurement, because so much of the work that Walker's Legacy does, so much of the work that I have done as a chamber CEO and executive, um, as an entrepreneur and resident for the District of Columbia, which I recently was appointed to, is about helping people get their goods and services sold to other people, to government agencies, to for-profit corporations. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. And, um, you know, that word resonated with me and it has really kind of stuck with me. Um, I left uh, Rochester when I was 16 and went to Howard and majored in technology. So I actually have a background in coding, which a lot of people don't know. <laughs> I think I knew that even. <laughs> I knew yeah. you were a bison, but I didn't realize that you were, the coding was the route that you took. Okay. Yeah. So my major was uh, computer operation based information systems. And um, now that we are kind of in this moment, for maybe like the last uh, five years to, to five years to the last decade, where we've talked a lot about diversity and technology, um, I always had a passion and an interest for uh, economics, for history, and for business. And I realized when I was doing, I was kind of minoring in African American history. And when I was doing that as a COBUS major, everybody was like, well, what is the purpose of this? Like, why are you doing this? These things are not even connected at all and kind of jump to another point in my career where I become the youngest uh, black chamber president in the country for a top 15 city in the nation and the youngest chamber president in the country for a top 15 city, regardless uh, of whether, That's where we uh, first met, yep. Mm -hmm. Yep, where we first met. And my, one of the, the biggest projects under my tenure there was founding the Black Technology Council. Mm. And so that brought my passion for African-American history, my passion for history, 
um, and my background in technology together. And so, you know, as I'm sharing these stories, it's just kind of saying that there were a lot of things that were happening when I was younger that I didn't even, I couldn't have foreseen that they would have influenced and impacted me in that, in the way that they did. Um, even seeing a strong female, and like my mom, a woman who was serving as an executive, really helped me as I started my first company when I was 26 and was part of the impetus for the birth of Walker's Legacy. Because I realized that I could go to my mom and ask, what's the difference between an LLC and a DBA? Right. And a lot of people either still don't know or had <laughs> one that asked that question of. And so um, from that and from other experiences that I had um, that were kind of predecessors in my experience to some of the, the things that have come up around the Me Too movement, that is how Walker's Legacy was formed for my desire to create a platform for empowering women um, that would allow us to be our full, true, authentic selves mm -hmm. and still be able to build the networks and supports that we need to grow, expand, and scale. Awesome. And this is, you're in your 10th year now. Congratulations. Thank you. Legacy. That, that's, that's quite a, that's quite a run. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you're not slowing down, which is great for all okay. of us. Um, in fact, I think that your influence is, is reaching um, further than um, where you started, of course. And I know that many additional cities now are getting the benefit of having um, the, the leadership of Walker's Legacy National and its program and its vision to come to fruition. And so, and, and the upstate of South Carolina um, is, is part of that, which I'm super excited about. I don't even think, I always tell people that I don't even think we were on their radar. And I was like, Greenville needs to be on there. So thanks for letting us in. We're, we're up there with the likes of, you know, LA and Chicago and DC. And so, yeah, we're, we're on the map and that feels good. Yes. Um, so let's talk. Yeah. I love Greenville um, after you invited me to go. So it's kind of like one of those things that comes up, but didn't come up to you before. <laughs> Yeah. Um, so a couple of my notable line sisters, Stephanie Brown James, is married to a man from from Greenville, and okay. her husband started Collective Pack. So Greenville is something. Yeah. That is, yeah. So yeah. You know, connect you to her because she's connected to Greenville through by way of her husband, and her husband's best friend is my other line sister's husband, um, and he is the director and vice president of human resources for Monumental Sports in Washington D.C. Nice. And so the Greenville, the Greenville guys that I know and the Greenville women <laughs> I know, top notch. That is great. And I know this community on, on today's virtual chat is much broader than Greenville and South Carolina, mm -hmm. but I certainly had to at least, you know, connect those dots. So I appreciate that. So let's talk a little bit more about Walker's legacy and the program offerings that you have, because there's so many. So just kind of share a little bit about um, those the significant programs that have generated such great success for so many. Yeah, so um, I think I'll start kind of with what's happened most recently. So um, two weeks ago, Walker's Legacy just onboarded a cohort of 40, um, 40 moms through our um, Mom to Enterprise Entrepreneurship Program, which is a uh, eight-week entrepreneurship program that is financial literacy and entrepreneurship focused. Mm -hmm. um, a week, a week before that, we graduated 50 uh, women from across the country in five cities through our Prospectus Entrepreneurship Program. Um, and so we're also gearing up for our Prospectus Bootcamp, which will be happening in Indianapolis. And then also the Prospectus National Online Accelerator that I will actually be teaching. Um, and so in total, over the course of uh, between March and the summer, Walker's Legacy will have trained nearly 300 to 500 women around entrepreneurship principles, taking them from everything from initial startup considerations to legal considerations, to marketing for your small business, technology for your small business, all the way to presenting for investors. And all of these programs are culminated with a graduation ceremony. I share those first one, because they are the things that we have been working most diligently on as of late. But two, because uh, so much of what Walker's Legacy does is really backboned in a foundation of programming. Yeah. Um, that programming is really the thing that is the undergird of our organization. These are uh, program services and offerings that we have done across the nation. Mm -hmm. I think in total, we've run a multi-week accelerator style program in at least 13 cities across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and we've watched uh, and we have uh, gotten um, feedback and um, uh, post kind of program performance review 
where we've seen women who've raised more than $40 million worth of, of capital for their company, um, whether that be through micro loans on over to venture capital investment. We've seen women who've been a part of Walker's Legacy uh, Network sell their companies to organizations like Amazon. Um, mm -hmm and go off and, 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 and do hundreds of millions of dollars worth of procurement business with the federal government or large corporations that have come out of and graduated from our programs. Just um, two and a half weeks ago, Essence uh, and uh, New Ventures had their $100,000 business plan pitch competition. Two of the women who were in that program were our products of Walker's Legacies Accelerator. Um, and so just to share kind of that, because that's the, that's the foundation. Our, our mission is to create the next generation of future millionaires, uh, mm -hmm. the same way that Madam CJ Walker was uh, one of the most notable um, women in business in her time. That is also complemented with the work that we do uh, through women like yourself, who are notable leaders in their community who produce programs to support local ecosystem development. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's really about bringing women together where they are uh, with notable women in their community so that one, those notable women can be seen and can be made to be more visible and accessible. And also the women who participate, attend and engage have an opportunity to build networks of strength and support related to their professional development and to their entrepreneurial pursuits. And so we look at it from two perspectives, right? So there are women who work in corporate America that we also want to have a relationship with and or may want to go off and become an entrepreneur at some point. And then there are women who are entrepreneurs today. And we also believe that those two communities need to be in better contact and communications with each other. Um, and so through the work of city directors, again, like you, Nika, who uh, are taking on the charge and launching um, Walker's Legacy in their cities. It's about building networks. It's using one of your words. It's about building local tribes. And then that bubbles up into other programs that we do. Um, and then the last couple of things that Walker's Legacy also does is content. So 365 um, and only and exclusively, we write articles pertaining to entrepreneurship, professional development, and highlighting successful women in business. And so I say 365 and in that way because you'll never go to Walker's Legacy website and see clickbait about what Beyonce wore to the Grammys or what someone's doing, you know, for this new thing. It's always about this woman has, um, you know, uh, reached X, Y, Z in sales or that she has accomplished this or she has done that and you should know more about her. And we found that things like PR teams are expensive undertakings for a lot of women who are starting companies. And so part of our job, and we feel, is to find that local talent, find that national talent, and to help elevate them to another level. And so we've seen women go on from being featured by Walker's Legacy to be featured by Forbes, to be featured by The Atlantic. Um, and they have on stages where they've been speaking said, but for my speaking at this Walker's Legacy event, or but for my being featured in Walker's Legacy, I would not have been featured in this particular magazine because we're, as you know, doing the good work of diversity. People always say we can't find folks. Right. Okay. Right. Upon ourselves to find the us's of the world. The women that you have, the women and, and allies that you have on this call today are women that we want to find and we want to help celebrate and honor them both through in-person programs as well as through digital content and other initiatives. That is awesome. And I love the fact that you are so solely focused on changing the narrative. You know, you gave the example of you're not going to come to the side and hear the latest that's going on with I mean, all that's great. And I do love Beyonce. But I mean, just generally speaking, we need to make sure that we are being thoughtful to change the narrative and to present the level of intelligence and the talent of women of color. You know, women of color are being disproportionately impacted right now. And, and so I, I love the fact that you have ramped up some of your programming to really cater towards um, the current climate, especially with the mompreneur, I think that's relatively new. And then the perspective is so exciting to see. Um, and so when we went through orientation, you know, you have <laughs> all of this, you know, this great background and the stats. And while I, I was familiar with that information, I don't think that I really understood the, the level and the severity of the disparity and why there was such a need for there to be a huge focus on women of color, you know, who enterprise and women of color career professionals, as you mentioned before, but the stats are there. So for our audience that um, may not, again, could be maybe at the same place that I was back when I went through that orientation, can you share some of those, the stark reality of why having a space and platform like national organizations such as Walker's Legacy is necessary? 
Yeah. Um, so I'll start just with, so one, Walker's Legacy was commissioned to do the first ever research study on Black female entrepreneurship by the Small Business Administration and the National Council, the National Women's Business Council. Mm -hmm. uh, we produced this report and subsequently led to other reports for the Latina entrepreneurs as well as Native American women entrepreneurs. Um, our research findings from our Black female entrepreneurship was one, you cannot talk about, and I mentioned this during orientation, you cannot talk about entrepreneurship in the African American community without focusing a considerable amount of your energies on the Black female. And the reason why is because there's no other community where women outnumber men as it relates to the number of businesses that are owned and operated. Mm -hmm. And so nearly 60% of all Black owned businesses are owned and operated by Black women. Yeah. So is huge that's more wow. than 50 percent a 60 percent it's like 58.9 percent of black owned businesses are owned and operated by black women um 40 percent of the uh community of women owned businesses are uh, run by women of color and so that includes latinas that includes uh african-american and um and that includes native american and asian american women-owned business enterprises which is a huge component within that subset 40% of that subset is represented by Black women entrepreneurs. Again, mm -hmm. we are also seeing over the course of uh, the 10 year time frame in which the census was taken between 2007 and 2015, that there was almost a, um, there was more than a 300% growth in the rate of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurial activity for uh, Black and Hispanic women owned enterprises. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, you know, at this stage in the game, uh, whether we're looking at finances and who is the kind of financial breadwinner of homes um, or the most dominant financial player for a community, or we're looking at the entrepreneurial acumen and entrepreneurial attainment, we are still talking about the woman. But mm -hmm. in that activity and in that growth and in that exponential just kind of skyrocket, we're still seeing um, considerable gaps as it relates to revenues. So again, the numbers and stats that I've just given were really focused on the um, development of firms. But as we know, um, a business that's in business today may not be in business, has, a 90, has less than a 90% chance of staying in business the next year, and less than a 5% of that 90% chance of staying in business for five years after that. So really only 5% of businesses make it to the five-year mark. So the formation is an important benchmark, but it's not the only benchmark. But revenues are what keep you in business for the long run. Right, of course. And so what we were looking at and what we saw was that um, despite the fact that in the Black business community, 60% of businesses are owned and operated by Black women, we were in the revenue range of less than $30,000 uh, obtained for uh, average revenues, while black male businesses were uh, close to $100,000 in their revenue attainment. And so you're seeing a chasm of between 60 and $70,000, which is sizable. Um, and both of these numbers need to be going up, right? So it's not just that we want to see the women's numbers rise. We also know that there is an, a gross inequity as it relates to access to capital, access to contracts, and opportunities for minority-owned businesses, period. But as we're looking at where the future is going, the future is the holding to the woman. And so that's why organizations like Walker's Legacy, that's why efforts like what you're doing with your intentional conversations are so critical and important because it's our time. It's our time. Uh, no, absolutely. I love that. I want to clarify two quick things. And I feel like this audience probably has um, concluded this based upon what you've shared. But you know, one of the conversations we had in a previous um, session like this was about how are we defining women of color? And unbeknown to me, what became evident is that there are some women who are not African American, but they're women of color. They've always felt that maybe that label did not apply to them, that they weren't a part of that larger population. And so I'm so glad that as you've been describing, you know, the stats and the work that Walker's Legacy is doing, this is in support of all women of color. And so, I, and I think that's great and beautiful. So just wanted to clarify that. So I'm wearing the signature Walker's Legacy t-shirt today. <laughs> I know, I feel bad because I don't have my <laughs> No, you're fine. <laughs> and, so, and at the top is Madam C.J. Walker. And so if you all have not connected the dots yet, <laughs> then of course, Walker's Legacy, um, the name of Walker's Legacy is inspired by the life of Madam C.J. Walker. And I understand that the great granddaughter is also a member of your foundation's board. And so that is, I'm sure that's been such a great honor to have her right 
in the center of the work, um, helping to continue this legacy that means so much to many of us. And, and I love the fact that at orientation, you said not only was Madam C.J. Walker um, the first self-made female millionaire, but she just happens to be an African American, you know. <laughs> and I think that's great because some people may not make that uh, make that connection. So let's talk about the Netflix movie. I don't know how many of you saw the movie. Yeah, I, I want to kind of I want to kind of liven this up a little bit. Talk about the movie. This, this, this is great intel. But I, you know, I'm sure some people are sitting back thinking, okay, well, you know, it was such an awaited occasion. Everybody was wanting the Netflix series to begin right away when they started announcing it. And so we have many watch parties all over, of course, and, and hopefully many of you um, have seen um, the Netflix series. Um, so what were your thoughts? What did you think about it? <laughs> well, <laughs> and then maybe talk about that in comparison to the book. Yeah, okay. Oh, and by the way, um, I hope you guys got your signed copies of the books from Alilia. I know. Yes. Oh, good. Yay. So great. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> okay, so um, the uh, movie. Um, so I can finally speak to it uh, a little bit more honestly, uh, because Alilia has been able to kind of come out with her perspectives on it. Um, I was and from the beginning, I've always been very excited and elated about the day when Madam Walker's story would actually be told on any screen, whether that be in Tinseltown, right. where, whether it be on, on Netflix. There were a number of things uh, about the Netflix series that I was disappointed by, mm -hmm. but I was in a position at that time just to hold my tongue because the broader message was about the resiliency, the entrepreneurial attainment, and the impact that this woman, Madam Walker, has had and had women at that time. And really the reason why Walker's legacy even became a name that I, I was thinking of for this organization. Mm -hmm. I think when it came time to tell her story, I was disappointed that it felt more like a hip hop opera than it did like what I felt would have been more like the crown. And mm -hmm. the crown it to me feels like it stays more on course with the true histories of occurrences. Mm -hmm. um, there are a number of things that the production company and producers took liberties on. Addie Malone's name is not Addie Malone. Her name was Annie Malone. And there was no real reason to change Annie Malone's name right. to Addie Malone um, when uh, you know she was a notable entre and successful entrepreneur herself. The extent of the dynamic between these two women um, for this, co the colorism conversation. So I just want to be the first person to say, I understand colorism is real. I, I recognize it. Um, and it, and it, it is, it, it affects the black community and it affects global communities. It's not just a black issue. There's colorism in India. There's colorism in Brazil. It's all over the world. Right. That was not the foundational premise of the issue that these two women had. Mm -hmm. And I feel that the movie took a lot of liberty to, make that an unnecessary, almost real housewives of wherever drama that didn't need to be incorporated into the, the life of a woman who had enough drama on her own. Like there was enough, <laughs> you know, there was, a, there was enough story to be told about how challenging and difficult it was as a black woman, Absolutely. as a woman to run a company during that time that you don't even have to make anything up. I mean, it was all right. there. Um, the person who was her right hand man, um, I oh god, his name escapes me, but he was the one who kept her books. They made right. um, his I can't uh, remember his name either. <laughs> like, I see his face, and I but I can't remember his name. He was actually not an alcoholic, he never drank ransom, yes, he never yeah. drank. Um, he was her best friend, he was her biggest confidant, and he was really the steward and bastion of Madame Walker's entire enterprise. Mm -hmm. um, while Alilia Jr., um, uh, I'm sorry, Alilia was out kind of doing other things and being in other places. And so there's just a lot that the movie unnecessarily, you know, didn't get right purposefully that mm -hmm. I didn't think there was a necessity to. That being said, and I'm sure this is probably more long-winded than you wanted me to be on. No, this is good and so We love your perspective. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> that being said, again, I'm happy that millions of households around the world are now aware of this woman and, um, and you know, and, and her legacy and her impact. And, you know, at her peak, Madam Walker had a, a network of about 20,000 women who worked with her as her sales mm -hmm. team. And she would bring them into community groups similar to our chapters, where they were brought to these chapter meetings and they would be taught about entrepreneurship and everything you heard her saying, I want you to know how to be a boss, essentially. Right. 
And so that is what we, that's, those are the shoulders that we have been really standing on for a long time. Um, and the last thing I'll say is that um, Booker T. Washington um, did not have a uh, good relationship with Madam Walker. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was not supportive of her um, at the conferences and of her of her work in general. Um, he, like many people, right? When we think about entrepreneurship, we have I, our idea of the ones that we want to celebrate. So, you know, some people think, oh, you're a hairdresser. That's not important enough. Like we need more businesses in this other area. Yeah. Listen, in my opinion, if you're in a position where you are making um, enough money to take care of yourself and, and, and God willing to take care of others through jobs, through employment and for your, and for your family, right. you know, legal. I don't care what you do. And it's not up to me to be in a position to try to make you feel demeaned. I mean, look at where we are in our economy right now. Someone yeah. who has a janitorial service, right? So when we would talk about, oh, minority businesses are over indexing and janitorial services and, and this and that and nursing and, and look at the companies that we need now. We need janitorial services. Mm -hmm. So it's like, we, we need not be in a place where we should ever be so significant um, or think we are so significant that any form of entrepreneurship is not, is not important. Like everything is going and moving. The air we breathe is, is also impacted by entrepreneurship. The quality of it, the water that we drink, the, the floors. If we see things on the floor that have little, um, now that we're in COVID, that have the little tape that says, you know, stand at social distancing, there's a company that got paid to come up with the concepts around what you see that you put your feet on, on the floor. And I always share this story about this woman whose story really impacted me. And then I'll be done. I know I told you. Oh, I was you're fine. <laughs> we're we're <laughs> loving your passion. We're feeling it. Keep going. <laughs> There's this woman who is the wealthiest woman in China. And she is the wealthiest woman in China because of this. She would take her husband's car, their, their family car, they only had one, and she would go from dumpster to dumpster to dumpster to dumpster, picking up uh, paper trash. She would take that paper trash and she would go to a recycling company and she would recycle it and get money from that. She now runs the largest paper recycling and paper manufacturing company in China. And she is a multi-billionaire. And one of the quotes that she would always talk about was that other people's trash essentially is someone else's treasure mm -hmm. and the of trash will never go out of business. Trash will never go out of business. That is so true. She's a multimillionaire now. Do and those stories a billionaire. Like, billionaire. Yes. And I and I feel like one of the greatest assets of Walker's legacy is telling those stories because sometimes all it takes is just to hear someone else's story and be inspired by it, especially if it's someone that kind of looks like me, right? And to say, I can do that too. And so I, I, I love all that's happening with Walker's Legacy and congratulations on 10 years. And thanks for adding some clarity in your perspective on <laughs> the movie. <laughs> because I, I think that a lot, I'm looking at the chat. And so people, so many people are like, yes, I was wondering about that. I wasn't quite sure. And so, yeah, it's, you know, we know how these things work. You know, you, you certainly are trying to tell a story, but you know, there's some embellishments made to really get the ratings where it needs to be. But we are glad that, like you, I, I do appreciate Netflix and, and all those who are part of bringing that to fruition for um, giving it space, giving it a platform, because I think that it allowed many more people to know about Madam C.J. Walker. And hopefully maybe they were researched on their own to know what's true and what's not, but so that was really great. So part of um, what we like to do as we're intersecting these conversations is to address topics related to business. And I feel like the intersection of DEI, leadership, and business, that's, that's all you in so many different ways. <laughs> but many people on this call today, they are entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs, and your journey has not been without challenges. You know, you, you freely, you know, talk about um, your challenges and, and the importance of failing forward. And so if you could talk about some of those challenges that you had on your journey to where you are. And, um, and, you know, again, your perspective on the importance of the mindset of viewing those challenges as an opportunity just to fail forward and get better. Absolutely. Um, so a couple of ways that I have uh, failed forward. Um, I've run out of money. And I always like to say any entrepreneur that you talk to that doesn't have a story about running out of money, <laughs> either isn't an entrepreneur or hasn't been in the game long enough. Absolutely. Um, 
And so it doesn't matter from Elon Musk over, right? And so um, it, it does not matter. If you are really pushing the limits on what you are trying to do, um, you may find yourself in a position where you have run out of money. And it could be that you have, I mean, I've been in a position where I've had receivables yeah. that I was waiting for that took six months to return, right? Yeah. Uh, the mm-hmm. work that was done, receivables I'm waiting for. Um, and I, I almost went out of business from the waiting period for right. money that was owed to me. So just because it's about, uh, you know, having a money issue doesn't mean that it's not like you weren't doing business and stuff. Right. Happening. It could be a cash flow management problem. It could be a receivables issue. It could be all kinds of stuff. And so I always like to tell people, one, that you should start with, first your own pocketbook and manage your own financial resources, because that is what is going to get you through any of those moments, which are inevitable moments in a company's trajectory, period and hands down. And so the better you can manage your own personal finances, the better you can manage the finances of your business. People love to be impressed by hearing about, oh, this company raised 5 million, this company raised 15 million. But the truth of the matter is, if you can't manage $500, you can't manage 50000 You can't right. manage $5 million. You can't manage $50 million. And so I have personally found that the people who've been the most financially prudent and frugal have been the ones who've been able to sustain themselves and navigate during times like this. I save a lot. I mean, I'm always saving money. And I could be more... Like I could have, you know, these shoes or have this bag or, you know, but I, I have chosen personally for me that I don't want to put my money and my, and my investments into that space at this time in my life. That's not my priority right now, maybe later, but right now it's not my biggest priority. And so as you're starting, I think you should think about where you can cut the fat back on things that you're doing for your life. Why is that also important? Because another form of failure is that you give up because you can't endure the sacrifices that are going to be required of you to be successful. What do I mean by that? Meaning you may not be able to go and do this and go and do that as much as you used to because you need to be saving your money. It needs to be allocated for something else or you just don't have it. And so there is a lifestyle change that comes with the formation of any business, um, particularly when you left a company and started a business on the side. Like that's, I mean, started a business fully and that's what you do full time. There are a lot of people who have a full time job and a side hustle, and that's totally fine. But there is a difference, in my opinion, between the impact that it has on you. When you go off and you you are just in your company and you have no safety net over here or anything right. like that. And so that's a whole different beast. It's a whole different animal. And it requires a whole nother level of preparation that um, I hope that as people are doing their side hustles, the best what they're doing, that they're saving all that side hustle money so that they could actually, if they want to go off and start this as a real full-time venture. That's my opinion about that, but that takes sacrifice. And a quote that I love is entrepreneurship is living a few years of your life like others won't. So you can live the rest of your life like others can't. Absolutely. Um, Yes. And then the last couple of things are the importance of um, managing relationships and building them. Um, You know, you could have a great relationship with someone who brought you into their company and has been doing business with you for the last five years. And, you know, I, I remember a moment where we lost a contract and I thought I was going to have to sell my second house. I mean, I I told the team, I thought I was gonna have to lay them all off. I didn't like, I had no idea. Mm -hmm. So I'm just like, I want you to stay, but I'm just letting you know, it's going to be a rough and bumpy road road ahead. And by the way, I'm, I'm the one who's not going to get paid first. So my commitment to you is that I will always make your payroll and I have never missed a payroll. Mm -hmm. And so that was very important to me, but, and they all stayed during that time. But what happened was when I lost that contract, it, it showed me and exposed to me just how vulnerable we were and dependent we were on one client. Yeah on two clients or on three clients, whatever the percentage mix is going to be for you. And so it's always good to diversify your portfolio. We use that a lot as we talk about stocks, but we don't use it a lot as we talk about businesses and clients and revenue streams for our companies. And so actually losing that contract, and I'm not going to tell you how much it was, but I 
if you add two more zeros to what that was, <laughs> <laughs> I ended up making that that back. And that was a that was a it wasn't a six figure contract. So I turned that um, you know contract into a six figure contract, a multi six figure contract from that one loss. Mm-hmm. And to me, that was worth the lesson. Yeah, absolutely. The time that it happened, woe is me, honey. I was depressed. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm serious. I didn't know. I didn't know up from down, right from wrong, nothing. But after I've been able to, through the Lord's grace, come out of that moment, as we all do, just like coming out of COVID, right? Like, right. There, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. But it's like, man, when you were like walking through, it's like, is this thing ever gonna let up? But right. it, the funny thing about all this is, Nika, we've been in here for seven weeks, eight weeks, nine right. weeks. And I, I want to tell you from my perspective, there are days where it's really tough and I'm like, is this ever going to end? And then there are days where I look up like today and I'm like, is it Friday already? <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> I can't believe it's already yeah. Friday. Yeah. And we're yeah. almost in June. Mm-hmm. And it's just like the time like has seemed to both go be slow and fast at the same time. It's a weird kind of situation that we're in. Um, but diversifying your portfolio is critical for a moment, such a time like this, because everybody is going through their ebbs and flows, where their money is coming from, where their money is not coming from. But you will be best and protected when you have got money coming from multiple different spaces to hold you through those buffer moments, which are inevitable. I mean, and we've seen some of the largest, most notable companies in the country and in the world have not been able to survive this. AMC Theaters has declared bankrupt. JP Morgan, uh, J- JC Penney's has declared bankruptcy. You know, this is to me, in my opinion, this is the time of the uh, of the of the nascent deer of the gazelle. This is the time right. of the nimble person because the big behemoth has so much overhead. And that's the other thing is as much as you can keep your overhead low for as long as you can keep it low, keep your overhead low because it's easier to to twist and turn when you don't have a whole bunch of stuff in the back of that truck. (laughs) If you are twisting and turning with a whole uh, apartment back there that you are moving at the same time and you can't make those quick, fast turns and you can't make that pivot real quick because you have to, bring all that stuff and make sure it's all coming at the same time. And that's what a lot of these large businesses are going through, but that's what prepares you all right now to come up as like the next whatever is because you are nimble enough to be able to survive this moment. But you have to also be in a position where you have been saving your money Mm -hmm. to be able to take advantage of it. So you do not need those shoes. You did not need that jacket. You did not need that new car. You do not need these non thing, these non-essential. Hey, we're talking about essential and non-essential. I don't think I've ever talked about essential and non-essential <laughs> most of my entire life, honey, ever. But it's, it is, oh, it's, it's true now. When we look in our closets. When I first started Walker's Legacy, I went through my closet and so every Gucci bag I had because I felt I did not need to be walking into a meeting begging for money with a Gucci bag, giving the wrong mm-hmm. impression. No, I want you to want to help me, not think I... I and I sold them and then I invested that money back into the company. It's time for us to go through our closets and look at what is essential and what's not essential. Mm-hmm. This is good. Y'all, y'all didn't know you were going to get this type of lesson today. Did you? <laughs> no, but seriously, I love this. And, and sometimes these are hard conversations to have because we don't want to cause people to feel like we're judging or shaming, but this is the information that we need to hear. And I'll be completely honest with you in saying that a lot of women of color, we definitely need to hear this because we have not necessarily been exposed to the pathway that some of our white female colleagues has been, have been exposed to. That We don't have that level of privilege oftentimes. And so and one of the things that I admire greatly about Walker's legacy, and again, this is all about your vision, is that it's, it's about the holistic approach to helping women of color. It's not just about, we need to make sure you have the business acumen to be a great entrepreneur, but how do we take care of your mental capacity to make sure you have that resilience to keep going? How do we help you build your brand? How do we help make sure that you know how to manage your coins, you know, your finances? And so it is, it is such a great asset to, um, to the country. And I'm so glad to see it continue to grow in different areas. 
So I'm going to give our audience the time to ask some specific questions. And so I have been so intently listening to all that Natalie's been sharing that while I've been looking down every so often to see if there's questions in the chat room, I think what I want to do now is just invite our audience, if anyone would like to unmute yourself and, and come, whether it's just audio or on camera, to share your questions or your comments to add to this discussion, I want to give you an opportunity to do so at this time. It's so good. Okay, looks like the group may still be, well, okay, go ahead. Angela, hi. Hi. <laughs> hi, good morning. How's everybody doing? Um, this has been great to just listen to, and so many things that you've talked about are things that my mother has talked to me about, because um, in the 70s, my mother started a printing company in a small town where, where I grew up, and people looked at her like she was crazy, because she was already teaching chemistry at a local college, and so why would you want to get into another business and open up something else? And I learned some really valuable lessons from that. One of them is not everybody that's in business with you is for you. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure that you have some insight on that topic. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, you know, as you go through business experiences, I mean, I've had with my company in, in Austin, I had a co-founder um, and I've Walker's Legacy, I don't have a co-founder um, and, you know, I love her to death. She's a mother now and, and got married, but we were in different places in our lives. She uh, started dating and that became the priority for, uh, for her. And so the business venture that we were creating together became a part of the back burner priority. Uh, I'm happy that it all worked out for her, which is good, but it also goes to show that when you are doing business with people, in some regards, you're kind of in a, in a business marriage with them, right? And so it's about choosing your partners wisely. Um, because even in their departure, there are things that you now need to kind of go through again, right? So who is her name on the books? Does, how much money might she be owed if, if, if she's now leaving the company? Does the company need to be dissolved? Does, can she just be removed? These are all like real questions when you're forming a business and partnership with someone where they're listed um, as a part of your LLC, or you might be a, a, a partnership, like a general partnership with them, or you might be brainstorming and ideating with your homegirl one day and she comes up with a great name and then you go off and become successful with it. And she's like, excuse me, I came up with that name. I'm owed something for this, right? So it's, it's important to be um, very um, professional around how you manage your business um, in a way that would probably feel uncomfortable if we were to communicate it about it from a marriage perspective. Uh, but I will go here and say this. I have friends that I do business with for Walker's Legacy. They have contracts with our organization that my legal team sends to them. I love you to death, but we still have a contract, right? And so there are all these legal considerations that you need to think about. And I also encourage people to, it's not that I want you to have a jaded perspective, don't have one, but go in and think about in the worst case scenario, which is what we don't do with marriage in the word. And I'm not married. So, you know, don't, don't ask me no questions. I got no advice to give. Okay. <laughs> but in the worst case scenario, what would be the way that I would have to get out of this or what would be my potential risk exposure in a circumstance like this? And you want to back yourself up from the worst case scenario to putting a document together that people would um, have to sign that presents itself for the worst case scenario. Because, you know, people are people. Some people are good people. Some people are not good people. And some people are everything in between. And sometimes you just don't know. It all depends on the circumstance that somebody is put in, right? Some people can do all kinds of things random when circumstances present themselves. We're seeing that right now, you know? Um, and so you just want to be protected for your business. And even in that protection, it's also about like understanding, okay, well, I can't talk to my friend about this anymore. Cause every time I express my interest in doing something, she always has like a slide sarcastic comment that, in, that I'm in terminate and internalizing. I end up with ruminating thoughts about this at night, thinking I'm not good enough to do this when really that is a projection. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's the tea. <laughs> that's the tea. That's the tea. <laughs> that, that on that. 
<laughs> awesome. Thank you, Angela, for your question. And so um, we have a few more moments. If there's another person who would like to come off mute and to share a question or, um, or commentary to the discussion, please feel free to do so now. Hey, this is Tiffany Davidson Parker. I'm the owner of Universal Therapeutic Services. Uh, Natalie, when you spoke about uh, this is the moment for the gazelle, that resonates with me totally. Uh, one, in that, you know, we're a two-year-old organization. And, and we have been afforded an opportunity to serve at such a time as this, but we've been operating in a very humble capacity for the past two years, right? And so in doing so, now we're able to not only survive, but to thrive, okay? So we are initiating a brand new program that wasn't even on our radar, case management. How many people, low-income families, you know, need case management, anybody who's, who's lost their job, who needs to get connected to resources. So many people need this resource of case management. In addition to that, we've just been afforded an opportunity to um, um, gain a, a whole new therapeutic practice for someone who said, I'm out of the game. I'm, I, I got to retire. I'm throwing in the towel. It's too much for me right now. And they sought us out and said, hey, can you serve these clients? So now not only are we surviving, but we're thriving, we're growing, we're scaling, and we're serving at a greater capacity. So everything you said totally resonates. And no, I didn't buy the shoes. <laughs> <laughs> Good. You know, I was just interviewing Nellie Galan uh, this Sunday, and she's got a new book coming out, and it's called Don't Buy Shoes, Buy Buildings. And I loved our conversation. So that's awesome. And kudos to you for seeing the opportunity. I always tell people that the, the Chinese character for chaos and opportunity are the same, are the same characters. And so um, this is a true moment of once, you know, again, you take the time to breathe, relax, relate, release. And because this is all happening on top of real life also, right? So, you know, I was going through a breakup and COVID happened. And I'm like, oh my God, like I can't even go out and like meet anyone. So this traumatizing for me and people are going through divorce they're going through having their kids at home too much lots of things are happening on top of COVID has happened on top of that component of their life right and so I think though once we come up because we have to come up for air right not drown in that it's important for us to start thinking about the opportunities that have presented themselves for ways that we can move forward because if we don't think about those things and we stay in a state of panic we will have missed out on one of the greatest opportunities of what is happening for this next, uh, the next century of our lives. And so I remember talking to someone who uh, had a therapy, uh, like a massage company and was like, well, we can't do this. And I'm like, listen, you need to go get your company certified with some uh, a health, uh, with some health and wellness circumstances, like to be a medical service provider, a therapeutic massage and take your therapist, your massage therapist, and now have them go and do in-home treatments for people during this COVID moment, instead of having people come to your therapy studio at your, at your studio. Um, you know, things of that nature. That's a pivot. That's just an, an initial like, okay, I was affected. I fell down. I got punched in the gut. I was looking around. Who punched me? It was COVID. I had to get up. I couldn't fight back. And now I'm like, okay, I got to keep walking down the street and I'm going to walk down the street in a way that's going to protect me best for the possibility of that happening to me again. That's the type of mindset and mentality that we need to be having. Um, I, Nika, I see a question in here from Joy Klingskills. I don't know okay. if I said you did. <laughs> oh, were you, were you going to do that? I'm sorry. No, I'm no, like, no, please do. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. What advice do I have about initial considerations in creating an online business for a service you used to provide in person, but are now providing virtual due to the pandemic? So it would, I need a little bit more information on exactly what the service is, but I will tell you this right now. Um, any, okay. So anything I got it. So anything that you were do private previously doing in person, I don't care what business it was. Um, I think it's important for you to see now that the writing on the wall is that there is also an absolute fundamental need, not a benefit, not a, Oh, I don't know how to do social media. That's for the young kids. No, everybody has to have an online digital component of their services and offerings. Period, hands down, stop, full pause, and we could shut the computer and laptop down from that. Like everybody has to have 
an online component to anything that they are offering. Because as we have seen, it is just too volatile to only be delivering. This goes back to the diversification of service delivery and the diversification of customers. It's too volatile to be so dependent on one way to access your customer base. So as it relates to things that you can do from an online perspective, you can start to build an online community. Online community around, for example, your business around fitness. But this is also a moment where building that community is probably gonna have to come to you free of charge. Meaning right now, if you're not already really deep in the digital space and deep in the digital game, you may be offering a lot of things to people for free for in increased brand awareness, increased brand access, and then you can start doing other things like offering these are uh, uh, instructor-led Zoom tutorial, uh, Zoom fitness instructions that we're going to be doing. Uh, we may be able to have people do like um, social distance approved uh, personal training. I know I was still working out with my personal trainer. He was way over yonder, but I, I knew when I needed to squat because I saw him, right? <laughs> So, so there are some, there are still some opportunities for service delivery with significant amounts of social distancing integration. Um, and so, but online is important to give you access. It opens the world to you and then integrating that with ways in which you may be able to connect and touch pe base with people like food delivery, dropping it off, pickup, all that. These restaurants never thought they were going to turn into, turn to the McDonald's model. Like they never thought they were going to be turning into Burger King and now they are Burger King. And they have had to adapt and that's just the way it goes and so doing the doing the online and in person is what's going to make you successful right now so that's the best advice i can give you for a pivot in that space no that is good that is really good intel you have been so resourceful today i mean just a wealth of knowledge you have inspired us you you've taken us to church in some areas um, but it's been really really good and i appreciate your time today i want to i want to wrap up with a couple quick remarks and then i want to give you the, the opportunity to share your final parting remarks with us as our special guest um, co-host today. But I wanna thank this audience. This audience continues to show up week after week. Many of you are um, repeat attendees, which I, I love. Um, we've also have um, gained some new additional people that are hearing about it, maybe from your network. And so I just wanna thank each of you. I wanna give a special shout out to the men that's on the call. Um, and I'm sure I'm gonna miss somebody, but I know that Brian is on, Ken, Terry, and Jerry. There could be some others but the reason I say that is because um, one of the reasons that Nally is here and that we're connected has a lot to do with um, my affinity also to women of color making sure that they're seen valued and heard and so every week that I've done this so far all of my presenters or co-hosts have been women of color we won't always be there but that's where my space is right now that's where I feel like the you know there's such a great opportunity because women of color right now are again um, overlooked in many regards. And so uh, we will continue to um, be thoughtful about diversifying and bringing some new and different topics that still relate to DEI leadership and business. But I always find it very appropriate to acknowledge the men, especially um, white men who take the time to be allies, to learn about this space, our lived experiences. And so I just want to thank all of the men that's on the call. I also want to share that again, don't forget that this, will, this has been recorded. So we will be sending this out later this afternoon. Uh, with some quick takeaways that you can meditate on, hopefully. And the last thing that I'll share before I turn it back over to Natalie is that um, one of the things we really didn't get to delve into today is the, the, um, the idea of mentorship and how that's really critical to this platform of, of Walker's legacy. In fact, the chapters all over are facilitating um, a matchmaking mentorship event between now and, and in June. And in fact, the Greenville chapter our matchmaking mentorship event is taking place on Tuesday, May 26th, from 6 to 7.30 um, via Zoom. And so I put a link into the chat room for those who are interested and would like to register to be a part of that. We have a great lineup of women that's going to be talking about their experience and forming mentorships. How do you really activate the right best practices to ensure that those relationships are very useful and helpful. And so um, I encourage you all to take a look at that if it's, if it's something of interest to you. And so with that said, Natalie, I want to give you the honor of giving us our final thoughts. Um, so take us out. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's always um, a great to participate in anything that you put together. I recall the first time I met you when I was speaking at the Greenville Chamber. So um, I'm honored anytime you call on me. 
Um, I encourage all of you to connect with Nika um, as it relates to her work period, but also to her work with Walker's Legacy. I know she just mentioned the upcoming Greenville Mentor Matchmaking Programming, um, but as soon as we get back to uh, business as new, new, new usual, okay. yeah. um, looking forward to some in-person programs that we'll be able to produce through her leadership there um, in Greenville. And if you're looking for another chapter, you're not from the Greenville area on this mm -hmm. call, please check us out at walkerslegacy.com. I did want to make note of a couple of things that we have going on. We talked about sure. mental health and wellness. Um, May is mental health uh, mm -hmm. awareness month. Anxiety is something that I have personally um, had ongoing struggles with. Um, and obviously it's heightened and elevated uh, during a time like this. Uh, and so we have a mental health summit coming up a virtual mental health summit coming up next week on Thursday. Um, Shanti Daz, who is the founder of an initiative called uh, Silence the Shame, which talks about anxiety, depression, and other mental um, mental circumstances and conditions. Um, she used to be a recording executive working with Babyface and others. Um, will be joining us as one of our featured keynotes, along with a number of very notable uh, women of color who are leading in the mental health and the physical health space. So I encourage you to participate in that. We also have, in partnership with, Walk, uh, with Howard University, coming up a national summit for women of color in business, which will be digital, taking place in June, which I encourage you to consider. And then lastly, I will be instructing our nine-week entrepreneurship program, Prospectus, uh, which is it's a virtual program, and you can um, take it and be anywhere. You can be in Topeka, Kansas, or you can be in New York City. Um, and I'd love for you all to consider registering for that program on our site. And everything is there on walkerslegacy.com. Again, Nika, thank you so much for having me. No, thank you. And you've just dropped so many nuggets. I want everybody to know, in case you missed all of that, we will share this in the follow-up email. Um, lots of great information that's going on. And there's some people in here that are, you know, giving some shout outs for Hampton University, Gabriel. So yeah, so you, you have some fellow bisons, I believe, that's on this call today. Um, <laughs> so that is great. Last but not least, I know I wanted to give you the parting remarks, but I meant to do this early on. As a DEI practitioner, it's so incredibly important to me to make sure that I use every opportunity where I have an audience to, to call out the names of those who um, have left us for reasons that um, I truly believe were, were unjustified and unwarranted. And so I just want to call out the names of Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor. And so anyway, thank you all so very much. Have a great weekend. Happy Memorial Day. And we'll see you next Friday. Thank you, Natalie. I appreciate you. Absolutely. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye.